Robert Daly is director of the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. He joins us to talk about Chinese Communist Party influence, or at least attempts at influence on behalf of the Chinese Party. Attempts at Communist influence. Party. Yeah. This is one of the really new aspects of U.S.-China relations. I'm not just saying this because it's a new year. It was coming up toward the end of 2017, but it's really come to the fore now. This question that China, as it builds what they call comprehensive national power, soft power and discursive power, it's not just a question, as it has been for years, of what is China doing that we don't like in China or East Asia, but what is already happening in American communities and American institutions now? And this is becoming a big part of the mix. Is this any different than what all nations do? It's a question of scale. All nations do this in various ways, obviously including the United States. We used to have the United States Information Agency, which is where I began my career in China, which was very much about communicating directly with publics, institutions, trying to shape perceptions. But it was all overt. Mm -hmm. It was all funded. It was all very clear. So that it, with China's case, we have to be very careful to make the right distinctions. Because once you start worrying about Chinese influence, it's very hard not to avoid phrases that smack of racism or that may in fact be racist. I, I've seen some sorts of alarms which sound like a sort of a new yellow hordes alarmism because of course one of China's major influences on the United States which is wonderful is the movement of talent from China which we badly need and which has been it's not just science and tech it's in the arts it's part of the American story so how do we warn about what is nefarious or concerning while welcoming the kinds of influence that should happen toward exchange. That's a tricky thing. When you were, were describing the difference, you said that the, the, the U.S. efforts were overt. Does, does that mean Chinese efforts are covert? We have several different sorts. So there's what we know China is doing as uh, it, does, it opens up Confucius Institutes, Confucius classrooms, which are known to be government-sponsored. China sends mostly Chinese language teachers to universities, to communities, to primary and secondary schools. And there's no question about who is sponsoring this. When China sets up uh, what used to be called China Central Television, what's now called China Global Television Network, here in Washington, D.C., and they have a worldwide English language uh, news program, 24-hour, mm -hmm. uh, that has a major base here, we know what that is. But there are other what China has called United Front organizations, which are about friendship or about helping Chinese students in America, which are in fact Chinese government funded to some degree and directed in communication with China. That's something the United States really doesn't do. And wh what is the export? It's not just culture. Uh, is it uh, ideology? It is ideology and it's really about acclimatizing uh, Americans to some of Chinese po China's points of view mm -hmm. and also legitimizing them. To take a very minor example. Uh, my children, as it happens, are in a Confucius classroom sponsored by the Chinese government in their public high school. Good. Thank you. We need Chinese language studies. It serves American interests. However, in that classroom is a Chinese government issued map of the People's Republic of China, including the Nine Dash Line, encompassing all of the South China Sea, uh, including uh, the Indian, what we recognize as the Indian province of Arunachal Pradesh, which China claims as its province, that is also included there. This map is on the wall. When the students asked, and I, I know this because my sons are in the classroom, is this Chinese territory? The teacher says, of course it is. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't, otherwise she says nothing about it. But the controversy isn't taught. So that as Chinese money, as some kinds of Chinese programs that we need not worry about come in, they tend to come with other kinds of carefully thought out, carefully planned decorations, uh, representations. So are, are the strings attached explicitly in the example that you give? Are instructors told this is the way you talk about it and avoid getting into the country? Well, China both trains and hires and dispatches the instructors. So the opportunity so is certainly there. So, so, so that is opaque, but there's every reason to think that it might be. And we're seeing now, again, it's, it's, it's a gray area, but we have a, a case at the University of Texas, Austin, where a Hong Kong group with very close, direct, and known ties to the Beijing government, uh, what, which funds a lot of programs, think tank kinds of programs, mm -hmm. conversations, publications, and also funds things like professorships around America. Uh, it had been proposed that this group, which is run by Tung Chi Hua, who was after 1997 when Hong Kong reverted to Chinese control, he was the first chief executive of Hong Kong, very close to Beijing. 
The University of Texas Austin's China Policy Program had proposed that Tung Chi Hua's organization be the primary sponsor or funder of that organization. And Senator Ted Cruz of Texas wrote a letter to the president of the university, which had been involved, he had been involved in ongoing discussions at UT. And they decided not to accept that funding. There was no clear sense that Tung Chi Hua was going to use or direct the program in any way. It was just that he also has ties to the, to the government. So, as I say, the, this tide is rising. So if, if, if Ted Cruz was on to this, should, should we assume that the larger U.S. government is, is very on to this? We know bit? that the larger U.S. government is on to it. Only yesterday we had a number of members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, including Senator Rubio, Senator Leahy, write a letter to Attorney General Jeffrey Sessions saying that all Chinese government-run media in the United States, including CCTV, the Xinhua News Service, should all be registered under the Foreign Agents Registration Act, or FARA. Uh, this follows on our requirement that RT, the Russian uh, program with which Michael Flynn had been involved, mm -hmm. register as a foreign agent. They are pushing for all state-run media, and all Chinese media are state-run, to register as foreign agents, which is not unreasonable. Uh, but again, th the tide is rising. We also see related to this concern about influence, concern about Chinese mergers and investments, uh, particularly through CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, which is taking a broader look at the national security implications of Chinese investments here stateside. Uh, Senators Cornyn and Feinstein have a, a, some draft legislation. Uh, you know, I think, Robert, one of the things that makes your analysis so valuable is that you're a very even-handed mm -hmm. analyst. When you make comparisons to Russia and we think about Russian interference, we don't talk about influence, we talk about interference. Right. There's a difference there. We also talk about meddling and we use these pejorative terms. Should we be thinking about China's efforts in the same vein? Well, we should be thinking about all foreign efforts in the same vein, and we should be careful in picking our vocabulary in every case. Mm -hmm. So some of the influence efforts of these nations are what we used to simply call cultural exchange. Americans should read more Chekhov. They should read more Tolstoy. There are all kinds of wonderful, enriching Russian influences that we can have, and the same, of course, is also true for China. We need to look at it case by case and ask what it does to you know, sort of fundamental American values, whether they're academic values or values of the free market. And what we're going to find, especially in China's case, because of the scale of China's rise and because of its purchasing power, is that China's pressures in the United States, China's influence here, cast a harsh spotlight in some cases on contradictions, different interests that evoke core American values. And we see this, you know, values of the market, values of security, values of academia and openness, and concerns about whether universities, American universities, should be training Chinese top physicists in aeronautics and astronautics. So we've never seen anything quite like this before. Would it, would it be fair to say that under Xi Jinping that uh, the exercise of soft power has developed a harder edge? And that uh, this is different in the way you describe it, and it's it's not just now about ballets or symphony orchestras, right. it's also about geopolitical points of view. It, it does have a harder edge in many regards, but the, the real issue is that it's so very well funded and, oh. and so pervasive. You know, China is not growing soft power through, the po through ideas or examples or through the attractiveness of its cultural products, which is something that the United States uh, enjoys in China. Really the efforts of the former USIA, now the Bureau of Public Diplomacy within the State Department, and the, uh, their various kinds of cultural programming are one one thousandth of the commercialized exchange in cultural mm -hmm. products, which we don't have to recommend to the Chinese because they're paying good money to bring them in. China doesn't have that kind of power. But through its ability to sponsor organizations, schools, Chinese language programs, through its ability to buy companies and to take an interest in the United States, uh, it is able to affect attitudes and practices. Some of that is organic, natural, and inevitable. But some of that we need to be alert to. Is it, what about within our world, the, the think tank world, uh, attempts to, to exert influence in that sphere? Well, uh, the question has been raised. Uh, in the case of UT, for example, Tung Chi Hua and his really quite well-known and very well-connected uh, China-U.S. Educational Foundation in Hong Kong, it has supported uh, programs at Brookings, at CSIS, at Carnegie. Uh, we have not in the past taken money directly from that organization, but we know that organization. 
uh, and it's conceivable that we would have taken money from them in the past. The political winds are shifting. Washington is paying attention. To the best of my knowledge, the UT proposal to have this organization be a major sponsor of uh, their China Policy Foundation would have been accepted. The proposal would have been made and accepted by comparable organizations five years ago. Its timing is bad, and it's now getting a harsh you know, a look from governments. They say Senator Cruz got involved. There have been instances in which we perhaps go overboard in concern about China's influence. China claims that all concern about Chinese influence is actually a racist, paranoid response or derives from our own fears of decline. Uh, that isn't true. We can, we can point to a lot of cases where, where China's directly involved. And to be clear, this isn't really about Chinese influence broadly. It's about the Chinese Communist Party influence it's, specifically. It's political. You know, Chinese cultural influence, China's contemporary cultural products, its music, its films, those interchanges take place via commercial channels, and America has essentially no interest in a lot of the arts that are coming out of a still unfree nation. Every once in a while, we'll get a good movie, um, and it will get a, a limited audience, in part just because Americans are too lazy to read subtitles <laughs> and don't like foreign <laughs> films. Um, but yes, we're talking about deliberate, directed Communist Party influence in the United States, not influence of Chinese traditional arts or culture or philosophy. Have you thought about this in terms of recommendations? I mean, I know that some of this is a new phenomena, but are we at a point where you would recommend best practices in I making think these decisions? I, I, I would. I think that the, the best practices, for example, for Hollywood film studios or for American universities, both of which are involved in this, are first to get involved in some experience sharing uh, and to meet uh, the film studio heads to get together, university presidents need to get together, realize they're not alone, and they need to self-regulate and self-inform and let the re rest of the United States know that they've got this. Because uh, I really don't think that Congress and the American government uh, is much more highly qualified to regulate culture or academia than is the CCP. I'm not, I don't think that we need government regulation. It needs to be done case by case, institute by institute, it is still very possible to work with Chinese partners, uh, but I think that the keynote needs to be if Chinese partners want to work in the United States, they must follow American practices, uphold institutional uh, best practices that are grounded in American values of openness. And if they can't do that, then they shouldn't be here. So that if the Confucius classrooms cannot accept a National Geographic map of East Asia on the wall of the classrooms, then maybe they need to look for other partners. Sounds like the Daily Doctrine. We'll, daily we'll, doctrine. we'll end there. Thanks, yes. Robert. Thank Fascinating you. subject.